players, playwrights, do do dudettes, amigos, amigas, everybody in between. Guess what? Episode 98. Woo-hoo. We are closing in on Cincuente, episode 100. That's 50, CN. 50 CN. times CN. two. Episode CN. Episode CN, but I say Cincuente times two, 100. <laughs> We are closing in. This is episode 98. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's get to a little bit of the quick housekeeping because that's what it says in the script. By the way, my name is Morgan Wright, and you are – who are you this week? It's Steve Murphy, but everybody calls me Murph. The Murph. Well, not man, everybody. The Murph-a-roni. Some people but, call me bad names. We're not going to talk about those. Yeah. Some people call me Tommy Bahama. But – Anyway, guys, hey, thank you guys for joining. Hey, uh, head on over to the Apple and Spotify. Hit those five stars. Let people know you're listening to us. Give the gift of sharing. Share one, tell one. We would really appreciate it. Leave your reviews. It's everything that helps us get more exposure and rank higher, which is what we're after. It's a game. We want to be number one. We want to win. Yay. Look at us. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. (laughs) Yes, we do. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com for everything. In fact, with our new guest coming up, Jared Kobeck, we're going to talk about his book, How to Find Zodiac. Uh, All of his books will be listed there along with our other authors. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Also, follow us on that thing they call social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But also make sure you go to Game of Crimes fans, our fan page run by our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. Answer a couple questions. If you are deemed worthy of entry, of of being uh, released into the inner sanctum, of being admitted, you will find where hilarity ensues and all the fun stuff. Right, Murph? (laughs) That's one way to put it, but it's very, very true. We do have a good time. (laughs) And that's so Game of Crimes fans, just look for us there. But where you got to be, where you got to be is Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We just got through recording our Q&A for the month of May. Hey, that rhymes, Q&A for the month of May. Um, Let the fourth be with you, right? <laughs> May the fourth be with you. Uh, <laughs> hey, we'll talk. Anyway, but uh, we get, we got in some interesting stuff. Uh, a lot of questions about what do we do about some of the shootings, gun violence, uh access to weapons. So a lot of good questions too about do we prefer sandals or thongs? And no not not the thongs you wear up the butt floss murph, the the ones on your feet. Oh. Yeah. Those but if you want to know what the answer is, you got to listen because we're not going to tell you. So get on over to patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. And I think this month, case of the month, we're going to do uh, the Boston Marathon bombings. We had a request to say, hey, do it like we did Waco last month on the documentary on Netflix. Mm-hmm. So I've watched that. It's great stuff. And obviously, you guys know we had Ed Davis on the show. So I think that's what we'll do for case of the month. But head on over to patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. That's where all the fun stuff happens. But you know what else is fun, Murph? Do you know what's what else what, is fun? What's fun? It's fun. The show is fun because we talk about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but... You know we're not going to take ourselves serious. Absolutely. And how do we prove that? Show me. Give me one example of how we prove we don't take ourselves seriously. Uh, Well, just listen to the few minutes we did before this. (laughs) Before we said this. (laughs) What's, What's another example? How else do we not take ourselves seriously? Well, um, there's a lot of self-deprecating fu- uh, humor in here, but we also have what we call... Guess what time it is? It's that time. It's oh. time for <laughs> Small Town Police Blotter. Yay! And by the way, um, I, got a, I got a triple hit on this one. All right. Okay, you ready? All right, ready. This comes to us from Wilmer, Texas, population 4,974. Salute. This isn't the one. This is this the, the next one coming up is the triple hit. This one is the triple hit for stupidity. A teenager in Texas told the cops he was just kidding when he walked into the Wilmer Police Department last week and told an officer to hand over his money. This young man seriously walked into a cop shop. This young man wasn't using his head for sure. Police Chief Victor Kemp said, You hear the world's dumbest criminals every once in a while, but you never think it's going to happen in your city. 18-year-old Keithon Manuel, who attempted to hold up the officer with a white towel over his hands, quickly realized where he was. Did you not? What a moron. And what he was doing and tried to change the subject, telling the policewoman he was there to check on a warrant. Perhaps realizing he wasn't about to be let off the hook, Manuel decided to go for broke, and then he told the officer, you do know I have a gun. Oh, that'll get you shot. 
He was arrested and promptly and booked into Dallas County Jail, where he remains charged with several crimes, the most serious of which being robbery. And this is his response. I didn't say nothing like that. I swear to God, I didn't say nothing like that. That's why they didn't find no guns on me. He told this to a local CVS affiliate over the phone. He submitted for an interview. He says, man, I play like that all the time. I didn't think she would take it seriously. Well, okay. While you're in lockup, reach down there and grab yourself by the ears and pull your head out of your ass. What an idiot. <laughs> Just talk about suicide by cop. <laughs> suicide by stupidity. Oh, a felonious stupidity. Wow. Well, Murph, this one comes to us from Flagler County, Florida. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Mm-hmm. So, Murph, if you were going to hire, you know, th- this is involving a, the technical term, people call them semi-trucks, but the actual term being a former trooper is truck tractor semi-trailer. Mm-hmm. But the big truck tractors, you know, we'll say semi-trucks for you folks out there. You got those huge semi trucks, right? The Peterbilts, the Kenworths, you know, the huge things like that, right? Right. If you were going to steal one, how might you go about hiding it? Hiding it? Yeah. You stole it, now you want to hide it. What would you do? Uh, I would put it in a building that nobody could see it, or I would put it in a in a huge lot where there's a lot of other cargo containers. Murph, you would have been years ahead of these, this group of... <laughs> Thieves. First of all, this uh, truck tractor was painted hot pink. So they're stealing a hot pink truck tractor. <laughs> Second of all, they went, it was a Peterbilt. They went to a Dave's Inn motel. They're sitting in the parking lot with literally 50 cans of spray paint attempting to spray paint the truck in the middle of broad daylight over the pink color and using red. And there are cans all over the place. So deputies arrived, both the man and the woman fled the scene, and a pursuit ensued on foot. Yeah. After two hours, the man and woman were caught hiding in the woods. Dianne Coutinho Gonzalez and Rainer Lorezo Perez, or Lazaro Perez, were taken into custody and are expected to face multiple charges, including grand theft auto. It's not a game, folks. And criminal mischief. Uh, they were later released from jail after posting a 30000 bond. The vehicle is valued at $280,000 and was stolen out of Columbia County just hours before the arrest. And what did they do? Drive to a day's end in broad daylight, buy 50 cans of spray paint, and attempted to spray over the hot paint. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> that sounds like a Patreon episode. You can't make this crap up. Oh, I got a, I got a candidate for you. Here it is, Murph. This All is right. our triple play. This is Here our hit for the cycle. A bank robber was was arrested. This is another smart one, right? After she posted a video on YouTube claiming to have stolen more than $6,000 at gunpoint. So in a bizarre YouTube video, Hannah Sabata, 19, is seen fanning herself with a wad of cash that she said was stolen using a gun, a pillowcase, and a note. Now, in a series of subtitles, she's subtitling this. She's writing this and showing this on YouTube. The YouTube video still exists, folks. Sabata of Stromsburg, Nebraska, population 1,143, Salute. Also claims to have stolen a Pontiac Grand Am during a crime spree that she described as the best day of my life. She was arrested last week in connection with the robbery of a Cornerstone Branch Bank in nearby Waco, population 299. Wow, that's really some awesome. Salute. <laughs> and the theft of a car in York, population 8,066. Salute. Salute. See, I told you. <laughs> Working all three of them in here. York County Sheriff Dale Radcliffe was quoted on the website as saying all but $30 of the stolen money has been recovered. She dressed in similar clothes, worn by that. Uh, the video entitled Chick Bank Robbery has been viewed at that time more than 7,000 times. Set to a backing of Green Day songs. So she did this to Green Day. She poses with a large amount of money and holds up sign saying she is a victim of the government. She said she planned to pay off student loans and go on a shopping spree. She also shows the camera some car keys and said her new car is shiny, but of course, I already took the license plate off. Like, that is going to fool law enforcement. Great job. <laughs> Towards the end of the seven-minute video, she writes that her baby was taken away, but that she can still find a purpose. Young lady, that purpose is making license plates in prison. And by the way, Murph, yep. just for fun, I pulled up her prison record. Uh-huh. Because she was so stupid and all the shit she did, she got 10 years for everything. But then while she was in prison, she decided to an assault one of the corrections officers so she got convicted of an assault of an officer of third degree so she had another year added onto her sentence so keep um, it up girl keep it up yep so we need, she we was, don't need you out here in population well no and there was some other stuff added to it i mean it she was sentenced to a minimum of 10 a maximum of 20 
on the robbery and then a minimum of one, maximum of two on the uh, assault. So she was sentenced to a total of 22 years. She is her next eligible parole review date is August of this year. She was denied a uh, parole in 2018 and she's projected to be released in 2028. Uh, you know, I mean, does she think she's Bonnie from Bonnie and Clyde, Bonnie Parker, out robbing banks? <sighs> no, she's good at making license plates, so. though. You know, I, that is just, oh, that just brings stupidity to, to a whole new level where you record it and put it out there for everybody to see bragging about it. What a moron. Well. She gets fortun- the Moron of the Day award. Fortunately, our next guest is not a moron. Um, no, not at all. We don't allow those on the show. Except for hosts. We allow those to be hosts, but not guests. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm going to let you work on that one for a minute, Murph. No, okay. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Hey, this, this actually started, guys, a couple episodes back uh, You know, with our new hosting company, Audio Boom. We got asked to do an ad read for mm-hmm. a new audio book that came out called How to Find Zodiac by Jared Kobach. And we got, to, we got to listen into it and stuff. We said, this is interesting because a lot of people have written about Zodiac. But and now this thing called the... Um, uh, case finders or something. Now, this group came out and said, hey, we figured out who the guy was, but law enforcement said, no, it's not the guy. They, they said he's not the suspect. But Jared in his book, and he's written several books. Jared's written that. He's written Motor Spirit, The Long Hunt for the Zodiac that came out before Only Americans Burn in Hell. Um, I Hate the Internet, which is one of the things that kind of brought him to uh, prominence. He wrote Atta. Uh, it's kind of a short story, a novel about Muhammad Atta and Do Everything Wrong and the future won't be a novel. So he's written a lot of stuff. So, it, but you know, we got interested in this thing about the the zodiac, and he's he did the research. One of the reasons we brought him on is because he did the research, Murph. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and it was fantastic. It's it's, uh, and as you're going to hear, you know, this is not solving the case of who the zodiac serial murderer is, but you look at the uh, clues that he uncovered. Some of the evidence he covered, and man, it, he suggests a potential person who is dead now, so this will probably never be solved, but it's very compelling what he comes across with. It's very believable. And the way he approached it, too, I mean, the, the way he did the research and why he did this as opposed to other things, but it's, it's good stuff. And we've, you know, this is the first time we've had just a straightforward author, but the reason we brought him on is because he did the research, he laid it out. Um, and this is a case of interest. You know, we're still trying to figure out the Zodiac. You know, this is the late 60s is when yeah. this happened, 68, 69. And to this day, we're still trying to figure out who the Zodiac is. And like I said, he's got some great theories. But we won't know about these theories, Murph, unless I ask you the penultimate question, the most important question of this segment so far. Do Are I know you what, ready? What, you're going to ask me if I know what penultimate means, right? Penultimate. Yeah. That's what I said. Not penultimate. Penultimate. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. All right. Well, here's the other question I'm pretty sure you can answer. Are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous, and still to this day unsolved game of crimes? Yeah, and I love this. So get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Let's find out what Jared found out about maybe who the Zodiac really is. Hey, all you players, playerettes, do do dudettes, amigos, amigas, everybody else in between. This is going to be special because we have – Murph, I think this is the first time we've actually brought on uh, a straight author, right? We've had people who've wrote books, but have we had uh, another author on? Who's the guy from uh, from the TV show, does all the crazy stuff? Murr. Murr. James Murr Murray. Right. But he's not, he's not a straightforward author. He was a – uh, he's a comedian, did the TV stuff. So, I mean, Jared, you you occupy a place of honor because we've interviewed good guys and good girls and bad guys, mm-hmm. um, and people have written books, but you are the first straightforward, you know, true author we've had on well, the show. So, well, welcome to the show, Jared Kobeck. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, and it remains to be seen. Are you going to be lumped in with the, the good guys or the bad guys? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> depends who you talk to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, and let's let's set everybody context. The reason we reached out to Jared, and Jared, you said something too. I, I want you to follow on this thread, but we um Audio Boom, who we we host with uh and represent us, you guys, your book that came out on Audible, um, they reached out to us to do an ad. We did, you know, an embedded ad and read it, and I we got to think and said, Hey, this would be cool to bring you on the show and talk about Zodiac, because you've written a unique 
I'm telling you, it's a unique book. I, I've read lots of books on different cases. We've had Dave Reichert, the Green River Killer, you know, folks on, but this is a very unique book. So, um, but you said that you get like a bunch of podcast requests, but you turn this down, but you're on ours. So let everybody know why, why you picked us. <laughs> Uh, you guys are cops, right? Like I, I'm a writer. Well, one of us was a real cop. The other one was a fed. So, I mean, we got to well, just clear that. It's cop. I mean, to me, it's cops. <laughs> right? Right. And, and we got to, we got to straighten that out right now. Jared. One of us was a cop and a fed and the other one changed tires and we got people gasoline because he was a trooper <laughs> and a detective. Okay. Yeah. A defective detective. Uh, okay. So let me say that differently. You guys were <laughs> law enforcement. There you, there you go. go. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was really interested in it because, uh, you know, you do, you do this stuff, you do something like how to find Zodiac and you get a wide range of opinions and everyone's opinion is valid, right? Like I, I have consistently said from the beginning of this, I do not think that I am any more right. Well, I don't even know if I'm right. This is an argument being put forward. And so the idea of having people who actually did this for a living, inter interacting with it and asking questions about it, that seems incredible. You know, people who were in law enforcement, I'm not law, law enforcement. You know, I could, I could just be I don't know, like another California maniac who thought but they you, who thought they saw the truth. You know what, Jared? Though a lot of our our listeners, uh, we have a Patreon channel, subscriber channel, in which one of our our monthly episodes is nine one one. What's your emergency? And in that, Morgan will find a nine one one call. I have no idea what we're going to listen to until I hear it, and we start recording. And I try to figure it out, but so do our listeners. And we think that's one of the things that people love so much is everybody. You know, even my wife, if you're watching something on TV, whatever the, the crime of the week is, you start deducing, all right, what really happened here? So the fact that you're coming on here and you spent the time to do all this research and come up with a new theory on what could potentially happen, I think this is one of the most intriguing things we've had on Game of Crime so far. I think the listeners are really going to love this. Yeah, because you don't have the baggage we do. We, we get Sometimes we get locked into it, you know, from a cop mentality or stuff, but you come into it. No baggage from that standpoint. It's like, you know, the rules don't apply in the same way that we would have to follow them. So you're thinking you're following things, which which we're going to get into here in a little bit because you're digging into the culture of zines and uh, Tolkien-related things, you know, uh, Tolkien and all of those different things. This this was very interesting. But before we do that, as we do with everybody, think of ours, Cosa Nostra. You have, a, <laughs> you have a fascination with this kind of stuff. I mean, you've got a novella out called Atta. Um, uh, you, you wrote a book about the internet in 2016. What was it? Why I Hate the Internet? It's just I Hate the Internet. I Hate the Internet, yeah. Why you got to love that right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, the thing about, the, the thing about that title is that the book's really negative about the internet, but the thing I never realized is if you write a book called I Hate the Internet, then everyone just assumes you really hate the internet and it becomes this, like it becomes the way that people refer to you. So maybe why I hate the internet might have been a little bit better. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you, you want that uh, attention grabber for the title of your book, and you got it. <laughs> yeah, more than I expected, I'll tell you that. But, but this, and we're going to talk about um, your book, which, by the way, I've got right here. It's, you know, How to Find Zodiac, uh, Jared Kobeck, and it's it's a really interesting cover because it's written, the front of it looks like it's written by Zodiac. It's, you know, it's in that style. Mm -hmm. But you've got, what, about 30 books out now or so? <laughs> oh, well, only about three good ones, so... <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's about 10, I think 10 or 10? 11. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I thought, I'm sorry. I was, I was reading a couple things here, just trying to do a little bit of research. So, um, but no, the reason, the reason I ask is how did you get started down this? Because this book, how to find Zodiac, that was kind of your third or fourth start on, on trying to do a book. One was about suicides, you know, on yeah. YouTube and some other stuff. How did you, you know, tell us, first of all, how did you get interested in this kind of stuff? Well, I mean, <laughs> It's interesting, right? Like I, as a writer, I occupy a very strange position where I fundamentally have my origins and this sounds so pretentious. So I apologize to all the litter listeners, but my origins are fundamentally in a kind of avant-garde writing, but that stuff gets boring by the time you're about 20, 21. 
And the stuff that really started to fascinate me was a kind of nonfiction that has a heavy crime element, you know? And I don't know. I, I turned out I was really good at research, which I didn't know until I did the book about Muhammad Atta, where to do that book, and I found that as a writer, one of the things that research really lets you do is not have to make choices. Because if you know, I don't know, if you know the, the, the paint on the wall in a room that Otto was in was yellow, that's a choice you don't have to make. And then you can, it limits the choices and it makes it easier. This sort of, you know, and I thought I was going to just be writing fiction forever. And then it's sort of, I hate the internet is arguably half nonfiction, half fiction. And then it just sort of drifted to where, what I was good at, hopefully, or, you know, what I was better at, put it that way. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. It's just really strange. It just, it just ended up here. And I mean, Zodiac is something. I've been fascinated with for decades. I used to live in San Francisco. I'd read Gray Smith's book, which is not the most accurate book, but it's a very good book. Like in terms of readability, nothing beats that book. Um, And yeah, right before the pandemic started, I was working on a book about this guy named Francois Genou. And Genou was one of the worst people who's ever lived. Um, he was a Swiss financier of terror. He was a Nazi. He was a literary age. Well, he wasn't legally a Nazi because he was Swiss and you couldn't be a Nazi, but he worked for the German intelligence agencies. After the war, he was the literary agent for uh, the Nazi high command's literary estates. And then he was kind of instrumental in the founding of Algiers. And then he got kicked out because they found him intolerable. But he had made a bunch of contacts in the Middle East. And so he became the financier of a lot of the terrorism of the 1970s and the 1980s. Okay. Well, well, how did you get how did you get onto him then? I mean, what, uh, there was a, where did that come a, from? There's a documentary um, that is called Terror's Advocate by this French director by Barbert Schroeder. My French is terrible. Um, it's about a guy who is the lawyer that represented all of these terrorists, and Genou is mentioned in the film because Genou. F- paid for the legal defense of all of these terrorists. Anyway, it's a really, you know, I could go on about this for hours, but the thing about Genou is it's this very strange marriage of far left terrorism and Nazi money. And it seemed like a great book, but then the pandemic happened and I, the Swiss archive shut down. So then I had a couple of other ideas, none of which I was able to bring to fruition And then I decided I wanted to write about Zodiac because I'd always been fascinated by it. And because, you know, and I give full credit to the people online, there has been a pretty active Zodiac community for about 25 years. And they have collated so much information about Zodiac that it gives you a way of thinking about how to dive in. And I mean, I ended up having to go back to as many original sources as I could. And so, you know, like the idea was not to write how to find Zodiac. The idea was to write its companion book, which ended up being called motor spirit, which is a straightforward history of the case. But in the process of doing that research, I stumbled across a name and the more that I found out about that name, the more it became clear that there would have to be 
a second book, which is what turned into How to Find Zodiac. So hang on to that thought, Jared and Steve, but we got to bring back one of our favorite folks. Man, I love these folks, and I'll tell you why. So what is HelloFresh? HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep, Steve. Skip the trips to the grocery store. Count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. And let me tell you, more than just delicious dinners, Murph. I mean, you can take your pick from 40 weekly recipes. You can choose from over 100 items to round out your order, from snacks and easy lunches to desserts and pantry necessities. Everything. One box on the day you choose. You know, and here's one of the things I really like about this, Morgan, is you get these recipes from other people, and you got to go to the grocery store, and you got to buy this special spice. It's like we got to call Billy Sarukas from the Marshalls to come in and hunt down this stuff for us. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that's not the case with HelloFresh. They send you everything. I mean, no matter what the dish is, all of the ingredients are there in one place. Cuts down on food waste, and it cuts down on making that special trip to the grocery store. Yeah, and you know what it does? And for me, I love it too because it makes dinner time a snap. It's (laughs) deliciously easy options. They please everybody. Look, they've got fit and wholesome to pescatarian to veggie. Whatever you want, they've got. They've got a meal plan, suits your lifestyle. Plus, you can swap out the proteins and sides, you know, and do stuff that you like. And there's an opportunity for you to save money. It's cheaper than going to the grocery store, and it's 25% minimum cheaper than takeout food. Yeah, and Murph, I got to tell you, I did the meatloaf the other night. I, in fact, one of the things I love about HelloFresh is I do the cooking. So I cook the meatloaf. Oh, I'm telling you, man. I, <laughs> I can't tell you how good – I'm serious. And I'm not saying this, guys. My wife is so picky about ingredients. When she loves it and she gives her stamp of approval, you know it's good. You done good, huh? Well, you know, for us, we try the chicken, uh, garlic, Parmesan spaghetti. And here's what I'm talking about, all the ingredients. They, they send you the tomatoes. They send you the garlic, the Tuscan heat spices, the spaghetti, the cutlets, the cream cheese, the Parmesan cheese. And you know what? On the, the card that they send you with the recipe, there's pictures there to show you what it's supposed to look like. I'm not a chef by any means, but when you got pictures, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Color within the lines, Murph. And, uh, but guys, we go on, but I'm telling you, I'm serious. Um, this stuff was so good. I mean, we ate three meals basically in a row, and I cooked them all. And if I cook them and my wife eats them, you know it's good. So guys, go to HelloFresh.com slash GOC16 and use code GO16 for 16 free meals plus shipping. That's wow. go to HelloFresh.com slash GOC16 and use code GOC16 for 16 free meals plus plus shipping. So guys, just remember, this is why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Good stuff. Order it today. Here's out of order. Hey, let's get back to Doc and to Jared, and let's go find the Zodiac. Well, before we go down this thread a little farther, let me go back and talk about uh, Francis, Francois. um, Genou. Genou. Was there ever, do you think there was ever any link between him and, quote, Carlos the Jackal? Oh, absolutely. No, he financed uh, Carlos's 1980s run. After Mossad assassinated Wadi Haddad, uh, who was the head of the PFLP, which Janu was part of, Janu was like arguably the third, the unacknowledged third in command of the PFLP. Suddenly, and, and Wadi Haddad had exiled Carlos the Jackal. Suddenly, Carlos the Jackal in the 80s becomes something like a, a, a for-hire terrorist. And Janu is the one who, by all accounts, gave him the money to stage all of these camp- campaigns. When Carlos is the Jackal's girlfriend, Magdalena Cop, gets arrested, she's arrested. And that's what sets... Carlos off in in the 80s and he starts bombing the shit out of France. He um she's arrested with a guy named Bruno I can't remember his last name, but the only reason Carlos knows him is because he he's Swiss and Janu introduced them. No, Janu is like someone will write that book someday, it probably won't be me. He is it's astonishing how one person could have their finger in so much horrible stuff that happened across three decades. Sounds like a combination of kind of like the Odessa file, you know, financing uh, the next rise of Nazis, you know, and, and things like that. That's, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's I love that kind of stuff too because I think there's so much more about World War II and that post World War II era that you know we can dive into. But so let's let's go back down that thread again. You said that um, you know the, the the archives closed and you were trying to figure out something else to write about. So you had like a couple other stop starts right before yeah. you did this next book on Zodiac. What were those stop starts? Um, one of them I can't rem- remember right now, but I think is in the book. <laughs> one of them was this idea called 15 YouTube suicides, which I found depressing in a way I didn't think I would. And I also had, I had some ethical concerns about it uh, because, you know, these are people who have families who have lives, but it was this idea of trying to, ex- trying to explore what happens to people who are kind of famous on YouTube, but not so famous that it's like a sustained wealth, you know, like people on YouTube who maybe make a little bit of cash off of it, but not a lot. Those people are in a really unfortunate situation where they have all the bad things about fame and very few of the things that being really famous can help protect you against the bad things of fame. And a lot of them ended up killing themselves and I think probably continue to do, but yeah, for a variety of reasons, I, I, I shelved that. And then, like I said, I sort of came upon this idea of writing about Zodiac why do you think there is such a fascination in America with serial killers? I mean, we uh, it's amazing. Like I said, we had uh, Dave Reichert on. He led the investigation into the Green River Killer. Mm-hmm. He actually ended up having a chat with Ted Bundy, you know, but you've seen you've seen Netflix series on serial yeah. killers, you know, their stuff. And Zodiac is one of the ones, I mean, that, that was like, uh, and I'm not trying to make it a numbers thing uh, from a number standpoint. There were five people, at least we know for sure, you know, attributed to Zodiac. But in the annals of when you got Ed Kemper and some of the other folks who yeah. were a little bit more prolific, but still to this day, why is there such a fascination with cases like Zodiac or um, the Golden State Killer and, sure. and things like that? What, what do you think it is as a writer when you're looking at it? What is it from a person standpoint, a people standpoint that goes, this is fascinating. I'd rather read this than books about you know how to improve myself. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the, the answer to that is really complex but with the – edition of Zodiac, because I think Zodiac is really different than other serial killers. And I have my own personal heresies about whether or not I even think serial killer is the right. I mean, he was a serial killer, but Zodiac is strange. Um, I think true crime in in its best form and the serial killer stuff is it allows people, you know, we all live with darkness. We live with our own darkness. We live with darkness that we see around the world. We live in this kind of mediated darkness where every single time you open your phone or you open your computer, the message you get is that there are really, really terrible things in the world and that you are not safe, right? And I think the serial killer is a way, a safe way, because generally they've been caught. You know how the story ends. It's a safe way to engage and a socially acceptable way to engage with that darkness without necessarily having to be part of that darkness. That's my best guess. I well, mean, it's like I'm, living vicariously. I mean, I, I can yeah. live through somebody else's eyes without having to go through what they did. And yeah, we asked that to Dave Riker. We've asked that to other people who've investigated, you know, complex or big cases. And it's still a fascinating thing to me is why it's so fascinating. To, it's to this day, even Scott Peterson, who killed his wife, Lacey, and their unborn kid, the dude got freaking offers, marriage offers in prison. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, there's, there's that aspect of it too, which is harder to deal with and harder to talk about, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think a lot of true crime rests on sex 
in a really uncomfortable way. Um, serial killers in particular, and that's what makes Zodiac really weird compared to other serial killers. Um, most other serial killers are what you could, what used to be called a lust killer, right? Like there's this sexualized element that arguably is the heart of the violence. And then the serial killer, I think for people who are engaging with true crime, this is yet another, like it's another way of engaging with a kind of sexual darkness that maybe people don't have a way to engage with in other aspects of their lives. And, you know, some people think this is kind of terrible. I, I'm of the opinion that it's probably fine. It, it can get a little gross. You know, true crime can get a little gross. Zodiac is really weird because there's not a hint of sex in Zodiac. There's just, I mean, maybe at Lake Berryessa, but that you really have to stretch it where if you think about Ted Bundy, the the unfortunate signatures of Ted Bundy are this kind of sexualized, pathologized violence. If you think about Zodiac, it's like a guy in a mask sending letters. It's it's a really unusual case because you know, in some ways, the nearest analogs would be something like Son of Sam or BTK, and like BTK really had pathologized sexuality. Well, and he everything. was from my home state. I knew guys that worked on that case. Dennis yeah. Rader. He lived in Park City. Yeah, that was a really sexualized case. Yeah. Um, and when you looked at Ted Bundy or Gary Ridgway, they they went back and had sex with the corpses. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, there's a very weird aspect and, to that. And and like Zodiac is particularly strange if you think about and I mean there's I don't know how you say this, but if you think about because you don't want to use the word famous, but infamous, if you think about the really profoundly infamous serial killers, there's not a lot of there's there's no sex in there compared to everyone else. There's ciphers and there's weird letters and there's this, that, and the other thing. And it's it so I think that what drives the fascination with Zodiac is actually probably something different than what drives the fascination with other serial killers. What it is, I can't fully figure out, but... It seems like with Zodiac that it, it's a, a catch me if you can type scenario where he's teasing everybody just to yeah. see. He thinks he's smarter than everybody else and nobody yeah. can figure it out. And, and look, here we are all these, all these years later, 50 plus years later, and we still haven't figured it out. Oh, trust me. I mean, I think one of the things... And we haven't mentioned the individual yet, but I, I, I assume we will. One of the things that I really found uncomfortable about writing How to Find Zodiac was this sense that if this is right, if the idea, the core idea is presented in the book is right, there's no way to write about this without really having the feeling of like, well, this guy won, you know, like this is a guy who did these crimes, told everyone you're too stupid to figure this out, essentially catch me if you can, mm -hmm. and then got away with it. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of writing about it, you're kind, if this idea is correct, you're kind of solidifying that, you know, and that, and that's a really uncomfortable thing to do. Well, yes. you've, I was going to say real quick, you've mentioned a couple of times heresy, you know, some moral issues are tentative. What, what is it in your background that, you know, because some people will write about, you know, they write about it kind of clinically, but you, you I'm mean, looking at you kind of with some moral qualms about writing about yeah. some of this stuff. Well, I mean, in fairness, I used to be a horrible person, you know, I, but as I've gotten older, the, I, the complexity of writing as an act and writing about people who are real, who have families, all of that stuff has weighed on me the more that I've done it. Um, I'm, I think ultimately I'm not a good writer of fiction. I am a pretty good writer of nonfiction, but with nonfiction, you're inherently, there's some inherently 
I don't want to say unethical because that's not the right word, but something, again, something like that. There's, there, there were really heavy issues. I mean, they're kind of like boundaries you just don't want to cross. Or that you have to cross. Okay. You know? That's fair. You know, if you think about writing about Zodiac, and this is something that's on me because I chose to write about it, all of those victims have families, Mm -hmm. right? They don't, even if this, all of the stuff that I've written is right or is the best Zodiac stuff or is the worst Zodiac stuff, realistically speaking, those people don't need another person writing about this horrible thing that happened to a family member that has come across, you know, that, that has been monetized and is everywhere. Like they don't need it. I don't, I, I, I am uncomfortable with contributing to that and yet I do it. (laughs) So figure that out. Well, I I would look at it from a different perspective here. Maybe, um, you know, this might help you a little bit psychologically. Um, I didn't know you were a psychologist too on the side there, Murph. There you go. That's, you know, I I took like two classes in college in psychology. That's my mind. I did an online (laughs) course once. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, we're, uh, my old DEA partner, Javier Pena, and I are involved in an investigation with some other folks that involves the disappearance of 15 Americans in 1938. Mm-hmm. And they still have surviving members here that we've interviewed, uh, you know, grandchildren, and now we're getting into great-grandchildren. And you know what? Every single one of them would like to know what happened. They'd like to know the truth. And yeah. it brings, you know, the way they explain it to us, because we had the same qualm when, when we came out with the narco series on Netflix. And, you know, we were very concerned that that Hollywood would try and sensationalize Pablo Escobar. And that was one of the original agreements with the creator of Narcos is that they promised, Eric Newman promised he was, promised us he would never sensationalize it. And, and he has lived up to his word. But the point with these other victims, and it's very similar to your situation here, they would just like to know what really happened. Yeah. You know, I mean, their their victim, their family members who were victims, they know they died, and they know probably know how they died, and they know it was probably a gruesome death. But at the same token, you'd like to see some justice come out of that. So I, I don't know if that helps you with your you know yeah, the way you look well, at things I mean, or not. It helps if I'm right, you know. But like, <laughs> if if I'm wrong, which I easily could be, then you have this. You know, I mean, I take your point. I know exactly what you mean, but particularly with this, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it'll be based in the results. Cause well, if it's, I, I, you know. I think I, and I know Morgan do, and I'm sure our listeners, I appreciate your honesty because you did the research is what, that's exactly what an investigator does. A detective goes out and does research. It's just another way of uh, another term to use. And then you've reported what you found. But you're being honest to the fact that, you know, it, it could all be BS. You know, this is what yeah. I found, though. This is what I'm basing my opinions on. What I personally appreciate is you didn't sensationalize stuff. You didn't try and titillate stuff. I mean, you, 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 you follow the facts where the facts take you. And I will tell you, Murph and I made a conscious decision when we started doing podcasting. We There's, you know, true crime is a huge category on podcasting. You know, it's big. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people... You had the same qualm we have, which is we do not want to profit off the misery of others. We don't go out and just tell a story. What we do that different is like you. We want to talk about the book. We want to interview you because you wrote the book. You did the research. We don't want to just get on and say, here's a story about an unsolved murder here and blah, blah, blah. And then you you, you bring up all the salacious details just because – there are, obviously there's a huge audience for that, but mm-hmm. this, what I like, it's more clinical in terms of you're still writing a book, you're getting a point of view, but you're not doing it to destroy somebody or you're not doing it. What I appreciate what you did and, and you take it from here, you did the research because that's what I want to get into. I mean, I've got the book here. Listening to the audio book is one thing, getting the book and seeing the diagrams and the QR codes at the back, folks, uh, Appendix D, I believe it is, QR codes. Um, you can get in there and, and follow, you can follow the logic. Let's t- let's start talking about this. You said I want to do the zodiac. That's like saying, "Huh, I think I want to build a skyscraper." <laughs> Where the hell do you start? <laughs> True. Uh, well, you know, one of the other books that I had tried to write, and this was not maybe this was I can't remember. In any event, I tried to write a book that was going to be called A Year of Death, and it was going to be. Every homicide in San Francisco in 1974. 
and try to write an incredibly in-depth article a, or like a blurb so maybe two or three thousand words each each homicide about who the person was where they came from what happened to them anything special about 1974 or you just picked that year i i think up until the 80s it was the year that had the highest number of homicides and it was also a particularly crazy year um the zebra murders happened. The paper bag killer got apprehended. It, it was like the tail end of the 1960s when everything had really started to sour. Uh, Zodiac may or may not have written a letter or several letters, actually. Um, some other stuff. Patty Hearst, you know, happened that year. It was it was a really crazy year. In San Francisco. Well, that, but, and Clint Eastwood, you know, and Dirty Harry, too. So, you know, he's he's creating a ruckus in San yeah, Francisco. So, <laughs> so uh, but I, I had really gotten good at using newspapers to trace people backwards. For, and, you know, some of this is the result of the online era, right? Where newspapers.com, uh, Genealogy Web, uh, there's another one that I can't remember the name of, uh, we live in a moment where it is astounding how much digitization there has been of old newspapers. And in my experience, having done this a couple of times, the old newspapers are not the definitive story. Often when a story continues to get told over time, the old newspapers are better if that makes any sense. So it's a little bit like the game of telephone, right? If I tell you something, if I whisper something in your ear, you whisper it in someone else's ear, by the time you get to the end of that chain, it's recognizable, but it's different. Um, and having, having done this, it seemed to me like, well, if you go and you read the newspapers and you see how the story un furled for the people that were living it in the moment and you look at the police files almost all of which are available except for the most important one which is the FFPD's file um you can you maybe there's a different story here maybe there's a different way to think about Z zodiac and again some of the online people a lot of the online people i should say were people who knew this they knew it too because i mean i think that i think the thing where you can see how this really happens is zodiac's first crimes are in december 1968 he doesn't write letters until his second crime his second attack in july 1969 and he, you know, in one of the letters, I think August 4th, 1969, he calls himself Zodiac, but the press doesn't start calling him Zodiac. Like they call him the cipher killer. They call him, you know, the code killer. The, the trade name does not stick until about October 15th. And that's a minor point, but it's a, it's a way of like, People were living, people knew there was a killer. They knew that this was a person sending in let letters and codes, but they didn't, the press wasn't calling him Zodiac. That's a, that's a very different story. And Jared, I want to pick up on that for a second, because it seems sure. like there's this fascination. We got to name something. It was like, yeah. even though it was Golden State Killer, it was early, the East Area Rapist or the original Night Stalker, you know, uh, and we've got to come up with. Green River Killer. You know, we got to come up. Yeah. What, what I'm asking you all these questions, but it's it's about it's about culture. You know, it's about a society. Sure. Why is why is there such a fascination too that we have? Can't we just say the guy who killed four people and the well, cases are linked? It's like society wants to say, but we got to call him something. Let's call him. Let's call him the cat litter killer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a yeah. unique name. <laughs> I mean, it's could... copyrighted trademark. Can't use it without permission of Ricky Bobby Inc. So, uh, <laughs> um, I think some of it is just the way that media works. Like you need, and particularly the serial killer emerging in the moment 
where print media is really dominant and you need headlines, right? And you can't, in a headline, you can't have, uh, you can't have like a detailed thing. You need a really quick thing that people can go to. You need the code killer to, so that people will know what article. Yeah, if the read. headline looks like an eye chart, nobody's going to read it. They want exactly, that. Yeah. So and so killer strikes <clears throat> again. That that and gets it, eyeballs. And I mean, I think as far as I know, and I could be wrong on this, I think the first killer who gets one of those names is Jack the Ripper. Um, no, that's that's not true. There were there were. I think it was H. That. Wasn't it H. R. R. Um, Holmes, like the original serial killer here in the United States, or that oh, guy yeah. too? Yeah. yeah, but I mean, even before Jack the Ripper in England, there was a guy called the London monster who went around slashing people. Um, but the interesting thing, the reason I mentioned Jack the Ripper is because by all accounts, the letter in which Jack the Ripper gets the trade name, which is how it's described in the letter is, was not written by Jack the Ripper. It was written by a journalist, like somebody who knew how it worked. Um, that's the best theory of it. The, the only Jack the Ripper letter that seems like it might be authentic is the from hell letter, uh, where whoever sent it included half a kidney. So, well, there's a trophy that kind of narrows it yeah. down. Well, all there no DNA testing, but who runs around with half a ki kidney, you know, yeah. in their back pocket. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, sick people, but, but, but see, that's what I'm saying. That's interesting because, but let's talk about this. I mean, you decided you wanted to do Zodiac. And so the question is, where do you start? I, I know you've got the other book, but now you're approaching it from a different thing. And so, I mean, there is, like say, thanks to, I use the digitization. I use newspapers.com all the time, you know, uh, ancestry.com. There is, it's an unbelievable, even working a couple cold cases that I do, how much information you can find out about yeah. people. Even to my point with my dad, I've got his digitized, you know, service card that when he joined uh, um uh the oh, army yeah. in 1940 before World War II, I've got I can see the writing. I see his I recognize his signature. I mean, it's amazing, you know, what we're doing. Yeah. But dude, where do you start? I mean, it's like how many banker boxes do you have to buy and how many sheets of paper? You're <laughs> oh, going to have I've, a ton of stuff. Yeah, I've got folders and I've also I've, I've printed out material. I've also got what ended up being something like a 60 or 70 gigabyte folder on my hard drive. Um, I, the idea was to, well, first of all, I wanted to write a little, I wanted the original conception of the book was of motor spirit was very different than what motor spirit turned out to be. Um, it was going to be about one of the people who has been accused of being Zodiac, who I found to be a weirdly compelling candidate while also not really passing the smell test for me. Um, and it was going to be, it was going to be a really pretentious, weird book where it was going to be a book that was half, yes, he is Zodiac and then half he isn't. Um, and so, I so just, you're arguing uh, against yourself for half yeah, the book. Yeah, well, I always try to. Um, no one is more aware of my own nonsense than I am. So I, uh, yeah, so I, I did a bunch of research about him. I and you know, but the the place where it really starts from is this idea of trying to do as much research as possible about everyone who's named to the degree that you can, to the degree that you need it. Because I think what gets lost with a lot of true crime writing is that people don't come out of nowhere. You know, people, criminals, cops, uh, victims, everybody comes from somewhere. And in a lot of ways, the choices and the things that happen to people are what bring them to that place, you know, that bring them to whatever the circumstance is. And maybe if you know a little something about who these people are to the degree that you can or where they come from, that makes things that seem perhaps inexplicable a little less inexplicable. Uh, and so you just, you know, you just put the material together 
you get as far as you can with it and then start writing. Well, let's let's put a pin in that for a second because I want to take you back because some one of the issues sometimes with law enforcement is that and this happened with the Golden State Killer case, a lot of reports did not exist because for rapes the statute of limitations is passed, right. you know, and so many of the case files had disappeared. When you started going back and started looking for these case files, how much of it was there, how much of it wasn't there? I mean, again, this full credit to the online Zodiac community. They had collated huge amounts of this data. Um, they had gotten police reports, They and they've had them for years. Uh, so most of it, most of the police reports that are available are online. Um, what's not available is the SFPD's file on it, which... Huh, is unfortunate because I think that after Zodiac did the killing of Paul Stein in San Francisco, a lot San Francisco sort of became the lead agency by default of its size. And that is not there. But so that stuff was available and stuff. Why are they is, holding why are they holding out on you? I mean I mean what I mean, this is California. They're letting killers out of jail. What's wrong with letting um you know somebody have access to a file that's fifty years old? I mean they I don't know I don't know. I don't understand the culture of the SFPD. Um I they are very as someone who has filed a lot of freedom of whatever the California equivalent is of a freedom public of public records request, I think, yeah. or whatever they call it. Yeah. They are really, really hard to get anything out of. Um, they often, even under the public records request act, there is law enforcement is supposed to provide you with a summary if they don't give you the file and the SFPD often will just refuse to even give you the summary. So, and I mean, if you had money, I guess you could sue them. But I mean, it's crazy too, because San Francisco, San Francisco has its own version of the Freedom of Information Act request. It has sun, sunshine ordinances. And it is, it's a notorious organization for trying to get anything out of. How many of those requests have you filed? Over time, quite a few. I don't know what the number is. But um, same result each time. They just refuse to give you anything or have you gotten yeah, anything out of it? I, I, I got something that other people wouldn't think was useful, but actually I think ends up being enormously useful. Um, probably the most useful thing I got out of them was the case file of a Zodiac copycat murder from of this guy named Robert Michael Salem, who it seems like it just was a gay sex thing gone wrong. And then his killer wrote, took the, uh, took Salem's blood and wrote so Satan saved Zodiac on the wall. Um, I managed to get photographs of that out of them and get more clarity in terms of how they figured out who did it. And that's actually weirdly an important case because after after a certain point, Zodiac really seems to only send letters with one or two exceptions in response to news stories about Zodiac or news stories about Zodiac copycats. Because lots of people, you know, it was, a, it was not 1969, 1970 was not the most mentally stable moment in California. So people, lots and lots of people would be like, yeah, I'm Zodiac. And then uh, Zodiac often would send letters in in response to that. So they sent me that, but that's because that case has been closed. Well, but you, br you bring up a good, you highlight a good point there too, because the difference between, let's just say like an Ed Kemper or a Ted Bundy or a Gary Ridgway, uh, even a, a Dennis Rader, until later, um, until he sent some trophies. But I, I tell you why he did that though. Um, but he, Zodiac wanted to be front and center. He wanted that attention, you know, vicariously. The other folks wanted to read about it. You know, they waited to hear about it and stuff, you know, so they followed it. But it's like Zodiac was like kept doing things with the letters and plus the ciphers, which obviously 
generates a whole nother stream of, uh, you know, a, a, in a, a lead and a and lead or a line of inquiry that you have to trace down. But he wanted it out there. He wanted to constantly be in the news. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to speculate, and I have avoided speculating on this, but at some point, clearly, this is someone who decided, I am going to drive this story. Um, at a certain point, he does step back a little bit, and then he becomes more responsive to other people driving the story. But for that autumn of and and late summer of 1969 that's someone who really is driving the story and is doing things specifically to drive the story i mean it's interesting too because so there's the first attack in december 1968 where uh he kills two kids there's the july 4th 1969 attack where uh, the woman is murdered and the, the male survives. And then the letters come on the 31st of July. And that those and he sends three more or less identical letters to three newspapers with three parts of the first cipher. Those letters to me, I think, are probably interesting. It might not be right, but the most revealing because it's a it's someone who doesn't know what works yet. He ha he doesn't call himself Zodiac in it. He d doesn't ask them to print the letters. He only asks them to print the ciphers. And it's the, the identity of Zodiac is not fully formed, but this is a person who learns. So he sees, so after those letters get printed, he sees what works. And then there's another letter essentially in response to in part the police captain at in Vallejo, but also who commenting on those first three letters and by that next letter, which is uh, August 3rd or 4th, he suddenly he's Zodiac, like the Zodiac that we think we know has emerged. This is a person who learns as it's happening and learns what works and learns what works in the media. And so I think it's very, there's a way then, because then there's two subsequent attacks. There's the attack at Lake Berryessa in on September 27th, where he's wearing the mask. And then there's the attack on the cab driver, Paul Stein, and which I think is October 11th, um, might be the 13th. I can't remember. Uh, and those are really different attacks, you know. Um, those are attacks by someone who know who has has learned something about the media, about how to how to manipulate the media, what's going to play, what's not going to play, and that's also very peculiar. Well, you know what's peculiar? Like you're talking about, he's wearing that hood, it, very distinctive type of hood. You know the sure. Why not just wear a pull a ski mask over whatever because you want to hide your face in well, case somebody sees it but he he in case he's seen he wants that to be i think kind yeah. of because when you look at serial killers there's two things you look at signature and mo they usually don't change their signature but they will change their mo as they learn like you say they learn to do sure. stuff but i think if he's seen i, I mean i don't know because uh, i haven't done the research like you have but it's like it, but he, he's seen that's the that's one of the images you see in the sketches. Is this right. this guy in this kind of Wiccan, you know, which the you know yeah. warlocky looking hood. Yeah, well, the hood is the weirdest thing, probably in all of it, because after Zodiac stabs um, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard at Lake Berryessa, Zodiac drives to. So that's in Napa County. Zodiac drives to the city of Napa, which is in Napa County, and he makes a phone call, which he had done after the Vallejo attack. And he says uh, something, you know, I killed these kids. He thinks they're dead, which means the mask was not, the hood was not put on to make an impression. Right. The hood there's if, if he had 
killed Brian Hartnell. And Brian Hartnell was a really big guy, which is why I think he survived. Um, he, he was, I've never been able to establish his actual height, but six, seven, six, eight, something like that. He was a really big guy. Um, if Hart and, and, and Cecilia Shepard actually lived for a little while after too, but if he had actually done what he was trying to do, we wouldn't know anything about the hood. You know, we wouldn't. So that to me suggests that it's not as important as we have all given it you know, this importance that we've bestowed upon it, this isn't a choice so much as it is what he happens to have around. Now, the reason I would posit he happens to have this around, and maybe this is a good way to segue into the meat of the book. Uh, one of the things that I discovered, and maybe someone else had before me, but I, I've seen no evidence of this. And you know, it's not some huge discovery, but, and, and the way that I found it was through investigating the person who is mentioned in, who's, who's the subject of my book. Every weekend day of September, 1969, about a hundred, uh, about not a hundred, about an hour and some change away from Lake Berryessa and San Rafael there was a Renaissance fair. And the thing that I would posit is, and, and one of the things that should be said is Renaissance fairs in those days were new. Uh, there'd been, a, there'd been running down in California for a little while. There was this group called the society for creative anachronism in Berkeley that did medieval recreations. But, there wasn't like, there wasn't, it wasn't a time like there is now where you could go on Amazon and be like, oh, I want an executioner's hood. People weren't selling that, even at Halloween. As far as I could tell, there weren't executioner's hoods. So you had to make your own. The costumes are all homemade. And you can see this in the footage of that Renaissance fair. You can see it in the publications of the Society for Creative Anachronism, which are like, well, you can buy this pattern and then adapt it to make this child's pattern and you can adapt it to make your own Renaissance costumes. So you have a guy who shows up with, from Hartnell's account, which is taken about 24 hours after the attack and thus is in many ways the most valid accounting of anything related to Zodiac because it's, and, and Hartnell doesn't even know who Zodiac is when he's being attacked. So there's no preconception here. He's talking about a guy who has this homemade medieval. He doesn't even use the word medieval. He just says he wears this weird, ingenious, homemade hood. You've got a guy wearing that on the same day that there's a Renaissance fair about 60 miles away. And it seems to me, given that we weren't, given that no one was supposed to know about the hood, that he thought everyone was dead, this is just the equivalent of something someone has in the back seat. This is the ski mask you have in the back seat. It's weird. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I recognize the weirdness of this logic, but I think it's probably right that the independent of the person that I've developed in the book, that that if you if you have someone doing a an attack and a murder wearing a hood that looks like a medieval hood and you have an event 60 or 70 miles away where people are wearing homemade medieval costumes that's probably a better explanation than some kind of you know occult ritual yeah, because I don't think most people would look at that hood. and Because, you know, sometimes I know um, 
some of the killers wanted to strike fear. They they thrived on the fear, the domination, the power that they have over their victim. And with him, it's like you'd look at that hood, and my first thought would be WTF. You know what is <laughs> what is that hood? And so, to, kind of to your point, it's like if it was designed to really scare people, I think it would have been done in yeah. a different way. But to your point, that that yeah. was interesting when I read it. It's like who else would be wearing stuff like this? And now. Yeah. I don't believe in coincidence, but you know, sixty miles away, which is not that far to drive, you're going to drive to stay away from it. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think again, the thing that I would recommend anyone read, if they really are interested, and it's online, it's in the Napa police files, is the interview with Hartnell that happens about twenty four hours after the event. He's a little high on painkillers, you can tell, but it's really such a different story than what you see in something like Fincher's Zodiac or even in Graysmith's Zodiac. Hartnell wasn't afraid of him. Hartnell is a giant guy. He, he's, he talks to the cops and he's like, yeah, I thought I could get the weapons away from him, but I was worried about the girl. You know, uh, Hartnell was not afraid. And that is, you know, he, he, and when he says it, I think we have to believe him because this, he, he's like, yeah, I think there was a moment where I really could have just reached out and taken away from him, but I was worried he would hurt her and taking it being the gun or the knife or something like that. And I kind of think. If you think about the fact that this guy is a giant, he probably was right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you know. I just I just googled the uh, Zodiac killer hoods, and you and there's a variety of hoods that you can look at here. But I'm thinking any one of them, if he just reached up and yanked that hood real one direction or the other, he would have blinded the killer. Yeah, I, I mean, particularly there's a it's not, it's hard to find, but Napa did its own sketch of the the hood and it's very different than what they look like uh like what the subsequent iterations of this hood have come down it's like you know it's like a five seven five eight five nine guy wearing a weird it almost looks like a it's not but it almost looks like a paper bag you know it, it does it's pretty it's pretty sketchy looking yeah the unknown comic strikes again yeah if you yeah. Guys remember the gong show um yeah because i'm pulling up some of these things there is so much stuff out there too uh and that's the hard part right yeah as you're going through this there's so much stuff out there how do you know uh, you've got to kind of have your bs meter going too because some of it's authoritative some of it's like some wacko dude conspiracy theorist that has it has to something to do with the, the waves coming out of the sun on the right day that's generating the, yeah. the signals in his head, right? So, you know, how, how do you go apply a BS filter to a lot of the stuff and get I, to the ground truth? I mean, for me, <clears throat> my approach has always been, is this stupid enough to be true, right? <laughs> like, I, I don't know how else to say it, where... <clears throat> It's got to be like most of life is really stupid. Most criminals are stupid. Everyone is kind of stupid. And we have this, I mean, the amount of stupid things I do in a day is unbelievable, you know? And it's just, I don't believe in, I don't believe in a kind of, I don't know how else to say it, like a Hollywood eyes narrative. I believe that things are messy and complicated and goofy. And the idea, there's nothing in Zodiac's. Now, I think Zodiac's letters reveal someone who's smarter than he actually gets a lot of credit for. Because uh, a lot of people, for a variety of reasons, want him to be dumb. I don't think that's right. But so the occultism is a really good angle, you know? Um, to, to think about this Zodiac 1969 is in San Francisco in 1969. There is no place in America other than maybe Los Angeles, but San Francisco has always been more in depth about things than Los Angeles. There's no place in America that is more occult 
than San Francisco in 1969. I wonder you if got, that had anything to do with the availability of recreational pharmaceuticals in yeah, that area. You would, you, yeah, I mean, drop enough acid and you start seeing <laughs> witches, right? What was that like, Timothy Leary said? You know, uh, tune in uh, or something and, you know, turn on, tune in and drop yeah. out, you know? Uh, no, I mean, I think the drugs are a huge, huge part of it. Um, but you look at the letters and <clears throat> other than the name Zodiac which is not a particularly occult name. There's certainly in the 1969 letters, there are no hints of occultism. None. <clears throat> there are, there's a guy making references to popular, well, semi-popular media, but occultists, when, even if you think about the Son of Sam letters, which are, you know, Berkowitz wasn't really an occultist, despite the Terry Murray. And his angle. dog really didn't talk to him. They, John Douglas, when he interviewed him, they kind of figured that part out too. Yeah, yeah. Duh. No, I, well, I mean, the whole thing about that—that's really strange—is Terry Murray, in whatever year it was, seventy-eight. You can find this on newspapers.com. He wrote a bunch of series about, uh, uh. Berkowitz that absolutely demolished the idea of Berkowitz as an occult killer. And then like a two years later, he became the, 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 the chief purveyor of this. Um, so a quick, I, I want to interject something quick thing. I know yeah. a guy named Chuck Dowdy retired from NYPD. His dad was one of the detectives that broke the son of Sam case. He's his dad was the one that found the parking ticket that tied oh, him back wow. to that area. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, but if you look at Berkowitz's letters, there's more uh, vaguely occult stuff in there than Zodiac's. Zodiac has Zodiac's complaining about a lot of things. He does not care about the occult, you know. So that's a way of that's a way of differentiating and thinking about the story as it happened versus the story as we, as some people want it to have happened or people have misremembered it happening or how people are afraid that it happened. And that's how you can, if you look at the text and the original text, the oldest texts, you can always get a better sense of how something happened. It doesn't mean those texts are right, but it does mean you can think about it, how people thought about it in the moment. It's amazing what's going on, the, the different variations of, of how people just look at things to start with, but then also how they can uh, expound that into theories that yeah. some are reasonable, but some are just plain out there wackadoo. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, some people who've proposed Zodiac candidates who have turned out not to be Zodiac are they're totally reasonable theories. And then some, and, and lots of the people have done very good work in service of those theories. And then there are people who, you know, <laughs> have, there are people with a tenuous hold on reality. And who that's, see well, that's a good way to say every way. <laughs> yeah, that's better than saying wackadoo, that, right? That identifies yeah. at least one of the people on this podcast. <laughs> Don't be talking about yourself, Morgan. Come on now. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two. 